Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, ASU joins an alliance of international universities. Also tonight, hear about a radio play to be broadcast in celebration of the state's 104th birthday. And we'll show you the musical side of a former state attorney general. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The Maricopa County Sheriff's Office announced today that it's putting body cameras on all of its deputies. The MCSO says it's purchased close to 700 cameras for the job. That's by far the largest use of body cameras by any law enforcement agency in the state. People no longer seem to trust, in many occasions, not everybody, uh, law enforcement, the media, politicians. At least body cams will give us a audio and video perspective of our duties. Uh, but keep in mind, that does not replace people. The cameras do not replace people. Sheriff Joe Arpaio used to be against body cameras, but a federal judge in a racial profiling suit required the cameras be used, and Arpaio later indicated that he now supports the technology. A memo regarding prayer before the start of sessions in the Arizona House has angered an atheist lawmaker. House Majority Leader Steve Montenegro put out a memo for rules regarding lawmakers who want to lead on the daily prayer to House floor. The memo states the prayer is, quote, a solemn request for guidance and help from God. Representative Juan Mendez, an atheist, was offended by the memo, saying that he wants to participate, but he doesn't believe in a God, and that would be referred to during the prayer. Mendez says he will not, has not indicated, I should say, if he will take legal action. And a House committee passed a bill today that would block state-shared revenues from cities that give ID cards to illegal immigrants. The bill was introduced by Representative Jay Lawrence of Scottsdale and would also target cities that block information that might indicate a person's immigration status. ASU is teaming up with King's College London and the University of New South Wales, Australia to form the PLUS Alliance, which is designed to help find research-led solutions to global challenges and expand access to world-class learning. Sethirman Panch Panchanathan is here to tell us more. He's the Executive Vice President of ASU's Office of Knowledge Enterprise Development. Panch, good to see you. Good to see you, Ted. Always a pleasure Glad having you here. on. Uh, what, what is that? What is exactly the PLUS Alliance? What are we talking about here? PLUS stands for Phoenix, London, the small U for universities, and S for Sydney. This is the bringing together of three world-class universities, Arizona State University here in Phoenix, as well as King's College London, an outstanding university, as well as the University of New South Wales in Australia. Three universities who are looking at what is the future of higher education, how might we make a huge impact globally on many fronts, working together in achieving goals in learning as well as in research. Why these particular universities? So King's College, as you know, is a very established, historically, uh, you know, an outstanding university, one of the top 20 universities in the, in, in the globe, and it is located in you know, London, which is the, the global capital, as well as University of New South Wales, which like ASU, is a younger university, uh, like ASU, for example, which is the number one most innovative university in the United States right now, which you might know. And University of New South Wales is also a highly innovative university, charting a pa path in terms of making a significant impact globally. So how did this venture come about? What, what got all this started? So basically the three university presidents, as I said, all of them looking to the future, uh, saw that there was a lot of commonality in terms of how they were looking at the path towards the future and saw the synergies that were there between the three universities, the complementarities, as well as the context that is because of the locations of these three universities, namely the Asian context that is covered by the University of New South Wales, the European context, of course, covered by the King's College, and ASU, of course, in the North American context, but all three then covering the rest of the globe in terms of different projects that we have across the, uh, the various continents. Uh, a couple of main goals here. Let's go to the first one, expanding access to world-class learning. How exactly will this happen? So by bringing together of the programs, the courses, and the various modules that we all offer in different realms, how might we bring that all together? And we, at ASU, as you know, we have got one of the most advanced digital uh, environment for, for learning. And we have 150 technology partners. 
Now, how might we take that kind of a digital immersion environment and be able to bring the content that your University of New South Wales and King's College provides along with ASU and be able to pretty much offer any program anywhere in the world for all those learners that are you know, very, very excited to want to participate in the higher education experience. And the second big goal here is to find research-led solutions to global challenges. Again, what are we talking about here? So if you look at global challenges, they require the bringing together of expertise across many different uh, disciplines and uh, different contexts, again, going back to that the point. So we are looking at sustainability as a broad umbrella, and within that we are targeting certain sub-themes. And one of the themes is in terms of how do you have global health you know, taken care of? How would you have sustainability in, in terms of environmental sustainability? How would you have you know, address the issue of social justice? How might we take you know, responsible innovation of advanced technology as themes that we will work together on? Let me give you an example. In terms of environmental sustainability, water. All of us have you know, challenges in terms of water in our own context, and it is a global problem. How might we then bring the collective experiences of all of us together to solve this problem of water into the future? And then another example would be the Ebola virus, which, as you know, mm -hmm. one of our professors, Professor Charlie Arnson, has done an amazing job in terms of creating the, the, the research work that led to the, the cure of the patients that came back from, uh, from Africa. So how might we then take these kinds of global challenges increasingly emerging across the globe uh, by bringing together all of our collective expertise to solve them in a rapid time scale? And as far as the students are concerned, uh, different kinds of degrees offered here? W what are we thinking? Yeah. Uh, at this point in time, we have over 18 degree programs, a couple of certificate programs already in place that we are going to be able to offer to not only the three university students, but also to the rest of the world. And as you can imagine, places like the BRIC countries, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, there are a lot of students who need higher education, but they don't have the capacities in their home countries to do that. So how might we be able to provide that uh, set of courses and, and programs for them? Well, with that in mind, I know that, that the plus works out pretty well with the Phoenix and London and, and uh, Australia and, and Sydney. So, but I mean, could you add a Brazil? Could you add a Norway? I mean, could the plus alliance grow? The plus alliance most certainly can grow, but the three are the founding partners and they are the only three universities that are part of that alliance. But we'll always have project specific partners that we will engage with in different parts of the world. You know, for a specific project, if we find in Africa that we need a, a local host country that would be, uh, you know, a university that would be a good partner, we'll always partner with them on those projects. But these are the three universities. I think we have collectively all the expertise that we would need. Last question, the importance of international, the international learning experience. Talk to us about that. Yeah. So if you take a student at ASU, as you know, students of the future have to be global citizens. They have to be globally aware. They'll have to have a global mindset and global experience. So how might this alliance and the courses and the modules and even the immersion experiences that these, these universities will offer for our students create the global citizens of the future, which means they're highly innovative and in turn then cause a huge impact locally, entrepreneurial uh, activities that will spurn in Arizona, in our yeah. hometown, as well as in terms of impacting our uh, you know, companies like Intel who are operating globally. With this kind of a mindset, they're going to be even more successful. All right. Well, sounds good, Ponch. Pretty thanks. exciting stuff. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. As always, thank you, Ted. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today.
Tonight's edition of Arizona Artbeat looks at Arizona Territory, a radio play set to be broadcast on Arizona's 104th birthday, February 14th. The Arizona Centennial Theater Foundation, along with KTAR Radio, will present the play, which will be performed live at Tempe Center for the Arts. Joining us now is Ben Tyler, Executive Director of ACTF and Director of the Radio Play. And also with us is the playwright of Arizona Territory, Richard Warren. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining Thanks. us. Thanks. So what exactly is Arizona Territory? Uh, Arizona Territory is a play from 1899 that actually made it to Broadway in 1913 and then toured the country, written by a fellow named Augustus Thomas with scenery by Frederick Remington. Wow. And, uh, and it was, uh, you know, it was a very successful play for him. A big time play at the time? Oh, yeah. It, well, as a matter of fact, Ed, it's billed as America's greatest play. <laughs> it's, it says it on the show posters. Really? Yeah, I think P.T. Barnum must have been I their PR say, man. Uh, <laughs> no lack of money. So uh, describe the story for us very quickly. Well, uh, you know, I think Richard could probably do a better well, job than we, that. We have our playwright we, here. We, I know we do. I'm asking you. Describe <laughs> okay. the story pretty quickly. You bet. Uh, this is a story that takes place right before the Spanish-American War uh, in Arizona. And uh, Augustus Thomas spent some time at an actual cattle ranch, the Sierra Bonita, uh, Sierra Vista. Sierra Vista? Sierra Bonita Ranch. Thank you. The Sierra Bonita Ranch, which actually still exists wow. down in southeastern Arizona. It's a cattle ranch. And uh, based this play on some of the people that he met there, one of them being Henry Clay Hooker, who was a very famous Arizona cattle rancher. And uh, so he, you know, at that time, Ted, Arizona was yes. really foreign land yes. to anything <clears throat> east of the Mississippi River. So I think that's why it had a lot of uh, interest back east. This is a play about the West that was written for the East. All right, Mr. Playwright, this yes. is, it was already a play. It was already how a play. did you change, what, how did you adapt this? Yeah, what, well, it, it involves the ranchers, it involves soldiers, and it involves the uh, uh, cowboys that were around at that particular period and how they got together. And I took the play, but it was really written in a style that was very popular in 1898, but it wouldn't work exactly today. So I condensed it from four acts to two acts, cut out about 30%, and I changed some of the characters so they'd be dealing with more contemporary issues. For example, I got rid of a wife, which made a, uh, the rancher a widower, and he was having to deal with two young daughters who were pretty frisky on the range. Now, did you do this? First, was, it, was it more melodramatic? The it, original? It, it was more melodramatic. It is still melodramatic. It's got virtue. It's got villainy. It's got a doctor that has a secret. It's got betrayal. And it's got it, a fair amount of laughs. Oh, it's, and it's a comedy. It's a melodramatic comedy. It's very yeah. funny, actually. Okay, yeah, well, yeah. with that in mind, then, yeah. when, when you adapted this and, and, and you know, get rid of the wife and whatever right, else you right, did there, right. did you do it in mind of radio or did you do no. it in mind of a better play? No, it was really written uh, as a play, and it was done at uh, the uh, Phoenix Theater New Works Festival in 2002. So since 2002, it's been kind of around. And then when uh, Ben and I were talking, we thought, well, this would be really interesting because it really does give the history of Arizona at that time. And then I had to change it to radio, which meant the actors can only act with their voices, yeah. and we have sound effects, and we have music. So it's a very different kind of play. Talk about the challenges of doing a radio play. Well, I think, uh, what, as Richard just said, it's all about the voice. Uh, actors and all the people in our cast are very seasoned, experienced theatrical actors, and this goes against the grain a little bit. You're not uh, talking directly to someone even though you're doing dialogue with them. And I think what will be really interesting for the live audience that comes down to see this is it's a, a little bit like getting to look backstage and see how things happen. What the audience is going to hear at home on the radio or, or over the internet, um, they won't see the sound effects artists with the coconut shells going across the gravel and doors opening and closing and squeaky floorboards and all the other things <clears> that we're <throat> going to add to this. Um, so for the actors, I think it's just relying on one thing, and that's your voice, and they're not used to doing that to a degree. Is a playwright used to doing that? No, this is the first time I've done radio, yeah. so that's why it was really interesting. In order to get into it, I went back and read scripts from old radio shows like Gunsmoke, like The Lone Ranger, even like Casablanca and The Maltese Falcon, to see really how you do just use voice, sound effects and music. Do you, you find that now being able to do this might affect your, your playwriting for regular theater? Uh, no, I think it's really a different structure. So it's, it's that it, different, it, isn't it's it? It's very, very different. It's the same story, but a very different challenge. How about know? for the actors now? Are they going to have to, to, to think of this and to, to train in a different way? Yes. 
And uh, we had our first rehearsal last night. We do four rehearsals and then we're on, you know. And, but the, see, the, this is the thing. No one is memorized. You're working off a script, you know. So um, they need to just kind of let go of some of the things that would normally be the tools in your tool bag for doing a, a live play and just trust that their voice is going to yeah. carry the whole thing. We did this last year. Um, on Statehood Day, and we, we intend to make this a traditional thing. That was Escape from Papago Park, is Absolutely. that what that was? Absolutely, yes. I think I was here talking to I think you, you were, it. and it, how was the action to that? Uh, well, it was, we sold out. I, it, was, it was amazing. We were doing a play that nobody had ever heard of, and uh, it had no one famous in it, and we did it at the uh, uh, Arizona Historical Society in Tempe, and we sold out the auditorium. So now we've moved up. We're at the Tempe Center for the Arts. We're in a 600-seat theater. Uh, it's a, if you've never been to Tempe Center for the Arts, I would really encourage you to come out and see that. Uh, it's a beautiful, really nice theater, and uh, we're going to put on a heck of a show. I have one more question regarding the, sure. the process here. Um, usually playwrights, even script writers, they write, and then when they see what they've written, oh, my goodness, sometimes it's exactly what they thought, and other yeah. times it's like, what, what are they doing to my stuff? Right. How, how, through the rehearsals, I mean, is it what you imagined it would be? Uh, so far, we've had one rehearsal, which was a read-through. Ben and I are going down right after this show, and we'll be doing Act 1, tomorrow Act 2, put it all together on Saturday. So we'll see, and I think we're going to be discussing the script and the maybe yeah. things that work or don't work or one can't visualize or you don't know who's speaking. So there's going to be a lot of challenges, and I'm looking forward to that. All right, last, let's, real quickly again, where... And when? Tempe Center for the Arts, which is over on Rio Salado Parkway, Sunday the 14th. Some people call it Valentine's Day. We call it <laughs> Statehood Day. Yes. It'll be at 7 o'clock in the evening. And uh, we have special discounts for seniors, students, and military. We really hope you'll join us. And here's the cool thing, Ted. If for whatever reason you can't make it down there, you can hear it on the radio or you can hear it globally on the Internet. Oh, my goodness. KTAR will be streaming it live from their website. So if you're out of town... You can hear it there. Well, yeah, you, yes. Yes, and Pat McMahon will be narrating it. Will yes. he really? Yeah. I think he was it, in the original version of this he play. Was, yes. He uh, was, he was. I think he used to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I would say break a leg, but in this, break a tonsil. How's okay, that? thank All you right. very much. Good to have Appreciate you both it. here. Thanks, Thanks Dad. Arizona Attorney General Grant Woods served as the state's top law enforcement officer for eight years, but recently Woods found a different kind of service. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Scott Olson explain. So the things I'd like to cover are first... Attorney Grant Woods is holding court inside Three Leaf yeah. Recording Studio. The way I have this sketched out, they're going to be doing a lot. In order this group to, has already done a lot, uh, donating projects, their time okay. and talents to the project. What started as a way to highlight Arizona musicians quickly became something more. Everyone viewed it as a chance to kind of show Arizona in a different light than sometimes um, uh, it's portrayed. It's not all divisive, ideological splits. It's a very uh, welcoming place. It's a very diverse place. It's not a, uh, it's not a balkanized place in my view. To see that, Wood says, you just need to listen. The first song in the record is called Ride Out the Storm. And when I wrote Ride Out the Storm, uh, I, I envisioned that it could be done, in my mind, either of two ways. You could either do it in your traditional singer-songwriter slash country version, Americana version, uh, maybe a Willie Nelson type, something like that. Uh, or 
it could be done as kind of the power uh, rock ballad. So uh, maybe a meatloaf or Kid Rock. Or Michael Nitro. About two in the morning he did his first vocal on it and uh, it was absolutely on the money. Each song from the project started like this. At the end of the battle. Woods At penned the end all ten songs. Of the night. I viewed this as a collaborative effort. I wanted them to to run with it and put their own stamp on it. And they did. Listen to Mindy Harris's take on Blues Hotel. I got the lights down low. And here's how Lawrence Zubia interpreted Mexican Dreams. I came here to get away. What would happen if I just stayed in my Mexican dream? Everything isn't how it seems. His lyric writing was just jumping out all over the place for me. While Richardson jumped at the chance to be part of the project, we caught up with him at the CD release party. It paints a different picture of Arizona, and it also tells a deeper story of Arizona. I think that it's time to get out. They travel the country or the world, and they say they're from Arizona. And oftentimes they get kind of a, a look or a reaction. Like, why, why would you live in Arizona? Because they don't, maybe those people have only heard some of the craziness that's come out of Arizona. Arizona has a great story behind the scenes and music is a great place to start because the musicians that have started out on Mill Avenue have toured the world and, and, and people wonder where this come from and you say Tempe, Arizona, I go wow, where's that? But if you focus back, you follow it back, you'll see that there's a lot of musicians right here that don't play the same way they play in LA, don't go to Nashville, they haven't gone to Seattle because there's an organic feel right here that's natural to Arizona. And now the spotlight is shifting to that. They also hope to shine a light on the next generation. The main thing, especially related to this project, is that we keep funding any part of the education system that's going to reach into the creative nature of children because we lose that and as adults we have to regain it and it's always a struggle to regain it in the midst of uh, uh, raising kids, having a profession, uh, things of this nature. But if it's brought up as a natural part of us, a natural part of our growth in the education system, supported there, then these kids don't have a problem going out and supporting their art. Even if they want to be a neurosurgeon, they'll still learn to play the saxophone and be in a jazz band. Or in the case of one former attorney general, set aside politics and pick up a guitar. I've been to 10 million political events, unfortunately. And uh, you know, even at the successful people in the room, they're always looking over their shoulder. They're always looking beyond the person they're talking to. And they're always, there's jockeying for positions. There's only a certain number of positions. Okay, so they're like, well, you know, I don't, I don't want that guy to do well because that, you know, he may run for this office and that blocks me. And it's all this nonsense constantly. We had, when the record was done, the singers had not heard the other, uh, most of the singers had not heard the other people's songs. So we had a uh, party at my house where everybody came over the musicians, the singers, and then we listened to the record. And I'm telling you, that was really an amazing experience uh, for everybody. Everyone in there was pulling for everybody else, and they were genuinely excited. Blaine Long is a good example. Uh, some of the people in the room had not uh, ever heard Blaine Long. They heard him sing the song called Me and Preacher. First time I met Preach was in a park downtown. Phenomenal, beautiful voice, great songwriter. The Bible, they were blown away and all positive. I was looking to be found. 
All they wanted was to uh, have everybody succeed. All they wanted was for, at the end of it, to have something we could really be proud of and to be moved by. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. From the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Culture Fund is made possible by Signal Society members Eleanor Light and Judith Hards, and by You Can Become a Curator of the Arts on Arizona PBS. For more information, call 602 496 8888.